Uh, welcome to the Murray End. My name is Mark Machado. I'm joined. Uh, we've all come out for this one. Um, Estelle Vaz, who's Devon Shrugger's top journalist, is joining us from Colombo. Nick Brooks. Um, Sri Lanka's top cricket historian is joining us from his very cold flat in South London. And Dominic <laughs> Machado, the professor of cryptology, joins us from across the pond in the US. We have all come together today to discuss um, Sanath Jayasuriya's so far quite short but quite illustrious and victoryful <laughs> um, career as head coach, head manager the head honcho of the shrunken men's senior side before we get onto that though let me remind you of a few little bits first if you haven't done so already please hit the subscribe button if you're listening in your podcast app or if you're watching on youtube it helps us out immensely leave us your likes we definitely for this episode more than any other want your comments what do you think of Sanath's uh, time as head coach so far um also just a reminder we've got a newsletter we haven't written on it for a couple of weeks what we will do there's lots of cricket coming up. There's the New Zealand uh, uh, Red Bull, White Ball series coming up. Then we're off to South Africa for what I think I'm going to build as a London game quarterfinal. If we can get through that with a positive <laughs> result, then we've got the semi final against the Aussies at the end of January. If if we're still in it, yeah. suddenly everyone in the whole world's in it. Um, <laughs> that's the thing, Sri Lanka, early adopters, right? Um, and then, and uh, yeah, so we've got lots of cricket coming up. Uh, so sign up for our newsletter. You can join our WhatsApp channel as well. When Sri Lanka are playing, we're a little bit more active in that. Uh, we put loads of kind of news and bits from when some of us get to the ground. Um, and hopefully there's going to be a lot more content actually coming from press conferences and such from uh, in and around the Sri Lanka team in the near future. If you want to be the first person to hear all about that and see all about that, join the WhatsApp uh, channel. We can't see your number. You can't see our number. So don't worry. We're not going to start messaging you, asking you for sponsorship letters or any of that sort. Uh, you don't need to worry about that. Um, it's just a way for us to, to to get our information to you guys as quickly as possible. Right, Sanath Jai, Syria, Dominic, what has been your take on his tenure so far? Okay, so my take on his tenure so far is that winning has been the first priority for Sanath. It's very clear that he wants to accumulate victories at home. And for me, the cost of winning, right, is that we're getting these short-term victories. We do not know how they're going to end up in the long term. I think particularly the white ball games at home are concerning to me because we've been playing them on slow, low pitches. And we'll really have to see, and we'll get a test of this when we go to New Zealand in the new year, um, for some white ball games to see how we fare on pitches that are not suited to spin. And I think that's, for me, the big takeaway is that Sanath has prioritized winning. It's his belief that winning um, produces more winning. I'm skeptical of this because I think of cricket as a skilled-based game. And I think you need different skill sets to play in different parts of the world. And you need different skill sets to win in different parts of the world. And I do not think that... We are cultivating it. The other thing is that um, Sanat's influence on selection has been curious to me. I think the team building that's going on has two problems with it. Um, the bigger problem is it seems like it's a throwback to an earlier or earlier decades of cricket, um, particularly with the batting lineup, batting nine deep with guys who all kind of bat very similarly. Um, the second thing is that there are some players who seem to be favored more than others in this um, system. The big one is Dinesh Chandamal, who has been included in white ball squads, T20 squads, um, someone like KJP, right? Again, who's playing decently, but we have a lot of older statesmen who are making squads and making teams who have well-known connections to Sanath. And the problem with that is... I see that there is a deeper pool, deeper, younger pool of talent in Sri Lanka now than there has been for 10 years, at least a decade. And we need to be taking advantage of that talent and using that talent before it goes away. So my take on Sanath is wind-driven philosophy, but 
that wind driven philosophy is fundamentally short sighted and not considering how the game is being played in the world um, and is driven a little bit by a buddyism cronyism instead of thinking about, OK, well, what players are going to be useful for five years from now? Um, if I can butt in on the, the young players thing, right? Like Sri Lanka aren't playing a major, like a world tournament for at least a couple of years, right? I think, is it 2026 where there's a World yeah. Cup? So you now is the time where you have the time to kind of blood the young ones and get them ready for those tournaments, right? That's why something like a selection of Dinesh Chandimal, I I don't I'm not a Dinesh Chandimal hater, right? I think that he's done he's done well with the opportunities he's got. I mean he's he's a superb test match cricket test match batter. I think underrated in a lot of aspects, even in ODI and limited overs cricket as a whole. I feel like he's tried to play the role that they want him to play. He hasn't been that successful, maybe because his game is not made for that kind of you know attacking um, or overly attacking type of play. So it's not his fault, but having players like him in the system, multiple players of his age, means that you're not able to kind of build towards that future, um, the, the future tournaments, right? I think that is what is to me concerning, because even if you look at, say, the 2023 uh, World Cup in India, Sri Lanka know those conditions are going to be similar to what you face here in terms of you know the weather and all of those things right mm -hmm. they sh they could have built from the 2019 world cup we had where they had like very odd selections in 2019 right and they should have been targeting 2023 to you know get the young players in and there was that kind of thinking as well but it was abandoned after a couple of years after not seeing success right so that that is concerning to me because you're seeing a lot of a a, a team players emerging te team players performing well overseas so now to me is the time where you give them opportunities because Sri Lanka aren't playing a lot of limited overs cricket um you know at a stretch right they're having breaks like after this New Zealand series then they don't play until January if I'm not mistaken yeah um so now is the time where you give those players opportunities and like even guys like Kamindu right there's no way he should be batting at seven or eight you know, like if you're playing him, it's kind of crazy to think that he should come at that level. Oh, sorry, at, at at that point in the lineup. So that part is concerning to me. I think on the pitches, I think winning is, and we, we spoke about this off air as well, like winning, it's great for the system as well, right? Because you kind of get that confidence and that belief that you can beat these teams. And I, I think although we criticized the same things during that India series. Um, I think that win would have given them a lot of confidence because that was in by no means a B team from India, right? That was, I think apart from maybe Bumrah, they had basically everyone they needed in that squad. Um, so that gives confidence, but I feel like you have to also have a balance where you are testing your players against a, an opponent's strengths because you're not going to always get conditions that suit you. And it's not like Sri Lanka plays low, low and slow that well either, right? So when it's mm -hmm. low and slow, like like what we saw in New York at the T20 World Cup, it becomes a bit of a lottery. Like, even if you are skilled, it becomes kind of, you know, little, little things can change the match around. So um, winning is great. And I think he's kind of infused that culture where win at all costs you know we do what we need to do to win but also there has to be one eye on the future where you're going to play in conditions that are most likely i won't say they're not going to be because if you look at the most mm -hmm. recent world cup they were really <laughs> shit wickets um but they're most likely going to be batting friendly right so you have to also prepare for those things because if you look at since 2021 We've always had hope about the teams because they've done well in bilaterals and they've done done well in the kind of not important series, right? They've shown glimpses of promise even going into 2024. We had hopes that they could push for at least to finish at five or six in that table. 2023 was the same, but they kind of fell apart um, in the big tournament itself. So it's important to not kind of get ahead of yourselves when you see this kind of success because it's not 
just after sanat came that you're seeing success right they mm-hmm. like even the fact that they are in the running for for the the world test championship final sanat's been in charge for one series of that they've done the work in the previous series as well right so i'm not taking anything away from him he's probably having an influence on on the results but you need to have an eye on the future as well and what you where you want to go right i agree with most of what you guys have said and i totally concur that picking chandamal for a t20 series where he's going to sit on the bench makes no sense when you can have a young player around the squad gaining experience i worry about what's happening to the stable of fast bowlers i mean you look at someone like dilshan madashanka who was such a breakout at the world cup last year he still only played 24 odis and you think that a guy like that needs to be getting more experience again the treatment of someone like dikshana who i think should be playing every white ball game for sri lanka and has been in and out because on the pitches on some of the pitches charith asalanka is more effective than dikshana and i mean i'm not sure that that's like uh i agree that's not a recipe yeah. for long term success but my rejoinder would be that in the last 6 7 years i can't remember a period of such success cross formats um that we've seen over the last few months since sanath's been in charge and uh i get the feeling that he's just connecting with players in a way that silverwood couldn't that mickey couldn't that even hathru didn't and i mean you saw there was a press conference from angelo when someone asked him what had changed and he was pretty unequivocal he was like it's sanath jaya surya and i mean we got to see it up close marky right a lot during the england series how positive the vibes were uh that everyone seemed to be relaxed everyone seemed to be singing from the same hymn sheet and when sanath spoke at the end of the series uh i was really impressed by the kind of um the content of what he said that he was like i want to win i want to win every game but i want these guys to do the right things and play cricket right and as much as there've been selection decisions that i haven't agreed with something like when you look at that lords test where the decision to bat first the decision for nisham madushka to keep wicket and open the batting it's a complete head scratch and no one can explain that and i think that are going to be those kind of things that keep cropping up along the road but i think when you counterbalance that against what he's getting out of the team and the improvements that we've seen from players and the kind of uh confidence that seems to be filling the squad that maybe that's a necessary trade off yeah i i i think you know the the one thing you got to consider above this is what what is the purpose of the shrunken cricket team's continuing existence and that is to you know it's obviously to spread kind of the word of cricket and for shrunken to have glorious wins but it's to kind of spread joy right and it does feel like this is a a joyful team at the moment i mean you you, you the easiest way to do that is to win games that's what they're doing um and i think some of the criticism that we've expressed thus far in the kind of 13 odd minutes of the show um are kind of right but i think there is it feels you know the fact that we're sitting here and i'm going yeah it's a quarter final against south africa and uh you know we we're just beating the west indies in in white ball games and and suddenly we we just have a bit of it just felt really flat didn't it at the end of that world cup last time round because it kind of felt like we have the players who can do something and we haven't we aren't doing things i think that you know there's a lot of talk obviously in the kind of wider cricket world about the kind of demise of test cricket but this feels like at this moment in time across the planet it feels mm-hmm. like test cricket's having a bit of a, rev- a fair revival and sri lanka and sri lankan players are right at the forefront of it i know there's a lot of senior players involved i don't necessarily think that's as bad a, a an issue as as you know it it might seem because i think they are important at creating that culture and creating that the the kind of tone about how to be a professional cricketer as well especially where when you're going abroad um on, on foreign tours right i think that that's where they they kind of come into it a little bit more i think 
you know, I've talked a lot about this on on this show, but I think Sanath represents something much bigger than just being an international, a very successful international cricketer, right? He, when you look at his career trajectory as a player, he kind of comes into the side um, has as this kind of bowling all rounder and doesn't have much success, and then kind of after quite a while rediscovers who he's who he's meant to be and the role he's meant to play in the team as an opener, right? And I think the fact he doesn't come from Colombo, he doesn't, you know, he, he didn't necessarily go to one of the big schools. I think he's absolutely massive in terms of the influence and impact he has around um, across the island. And also, you know, I, I, every every cricket team in the world at the moment appears to have somebody in their backroom staff from Sri Lanka. But like Salad is very, very Sri Lankan, right? He isn't like, um, you know, that sounds awful. Everyone is everyone who is Sri Lankan is Sri Lankan, but he he feels like a very local Sri Lankan, if you know what I mean. He's someone he's someone that people love. I often like I consider him like the kind of soul of Sri Lankan cricket, and it's a bit like you know we came away from that World Cup and somebody said we need to get back to who we are. We need to find out who we are. And it's like you you kind of go to the depths of your body and you get get to your soul um, and kind of drag it all out. I'm not sure, Sanath what is the kind of person who's going to do this job for 10 or 15 years. Mm. I don't think he does it much beyond the the next World Cup, to be honest. But I think for where we were and to where we are now, it feels quite quite a big leap. But Mark, he was with the team in the 2024 World Cup. He was, yeah, the, man on, on, so he was, the, he was the man on the ground there. And let's but, be honest, he was probably making the decisions as well, right? Yeah, but, but yeah, exactly. That's one thing that is good is that for a long time it was really murky who was in charge. You're like, mm. is Silverwood yeah. in charge? Is Mahela in charge? Is Sanath in charge? Now there's no doubt, right? Mm. Sanath's calling the shots. And I mean, He's you pushing all the buttons. Yeah. yeah, you look at the selection panel, guys like Upul and Ajantha, who are way junior to them. <laughs> if Sanath comes and says, I want this player in the squad, I don't see any of those guys saying, no, sir. Like, he's <laughs> yeah. he's a one-man band. And, I mean, you can argue that dictatorships haven't always been a good thing throughout the course of history. But I think that kind of um, single-minded focus is yeah. probably a bit of what Sri Lanka needs like right now. Yeah, I, I, don't, I think that is part of, you know, even though he was there for the World Cup, I think it it, it just become a bit weird. Like, I, none of us really knew he was making decisions. To be honest, when me and Nick were at, uh, were at Lords and we were trying to figure out whose decision it was to... Uh, was, what did they Netflix. do that? Did they call, uh, yeah. uh, 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 goal first. Goal first, goal first yeah. yeah. Then it, it did feel like nobody wanted to step up and take responsibility for that. But when the... You know, Sanath comes out and speaks to the press. The other thing that is really notable is how good his English has become, which makes me think he's wanted this job for quite a while. Like, he's been working away to try to improve himself. I think there might be other, other more high-profile jobs he was after, Mark. <laughs> but, yeah, possibly. But, but <laughs> like, to, to, to be able to, you know, he's, he's improved himself in some ways, right? And this so, is something he's wanted to do. I think uh, my, my response to he's good for the players, I, I can agree with that. I can see how you would make that argument. I could see the vibes-based argument for that. But my question is, is he good for all of the players? I think for the most vocal players on the team, like Angelo, right? They, they played together, right? It's kind of a return to this past era of glory. But for me, I wonder about the younger players, right? If you're Mahesh Thikshana, who, if we watch that West Indies series, he is a massively improved player. Like, his off-spinner was, like, he is ragging the ball at 95-plus uh, uh, KPH. And he, you know, he looks fantastic. He has a plan. He looks like a real wicket taper, taker up front. And for that second game where he came in and he made a huge difference, they said, oh, we weren't going to play him because we thought the conditions weren't going to suit his type of bowling. But he can be effective anywhere in the world. He's one of the players who, like, every side in the world would say, we'll put him on the team sheet. Matisha Patarana, right? Someone who um, that um, Chennai paid 13 cores to retain. He bowled two overs in 
the last of the of the T20 matches, right? Like again, any team would kill to have four death overs from Matisha Patirana. Um, if you're the likes of Kamindu Mendes, right? Are you batting at eight, right? <laughs> um, and I think part of it is we have a huge pool of talent, and that's really exciting. Players like Sadira Samarikrama and, and Jonas Lianage, right? Guys who we would have killed to have in like a 2019 squad, someone who can like score runs at 85 and keep the innings ticking along. If you have both of them in your squad, in a squad where you have Kamindu batting at eight, Mm -hmm. where you have other guys knocking at the door to come into the squad, that for me is the problem. And if you're a young player who's skilling up like a well Olegay, right? Like a Chimindu Wikramasinghe, like uh, like Dikshina, like Patirana. These are guys who, by sort of their own desire to be better players, their desire to like soak up every bit of knowledge they can and improve because you see them game to game, season to season, doing new and different things. Like when they're given this stop-start approach to are you going to be in the side? What role is your side? You're gonna are you gonna have in the side? Those are the players who should be the priceless pearls that you build the team around, right? And and I think yes, giving love to the seniors is great, and getting them to play well is great. But you also need to give love to those younger players and show unrelenting faith in them because they will repay you so richly. Like again with Chimindu, you have the makings of a fast bowling all rounder that we have so sorely needed in white ball cricket for the last, you know, since Angelo was an effective white ball all rounder, but we drop him after one match. And, and that to me is worrisome. So I think Sanath is great for the leaders of the team. And I think he's doing well with the leaders of the team, the seniors in the team, but the younger players who don't get much of a, a voice, you could see, Dikshina was kind of disheartened about the fact that he wasn't really playing much. And you can tell he feels frustrated about that. Um, So I take that he is good for some players in the team. He's good for building confidence. But there are some players who are definitely negatively affected by Sonneth's managerial style. So, so the the my I've got a few thoughts about what you just said. Firstly, I think every professional male cricketer in Sri Lanka should be gutted they're not in any every starting eleven. Right, that's the kind of attitude as a fan I want to see. Um, secondly, I think a lot of this comes down to how the nature of of the role that Sanath currently has is actually evolving in cricket, and we're seeing this across everywhere. Right, where I think increasingly you. are particularly with, with white ball cricket, you're going to see... So if you, if you go back to even the glory days, the, the the kind of high peak of Sri Lankan white ball cricket, which was probably about 2014, right? Yeah. There was pretty much about 14 players who you'd consider in and around the Sri Lanka squad like good enough to play international cricket. And it was probably the same for most teams, apart from maybe India and Australia, right? Where now, actually, with the proliferation of of T Twenty leagues, and you, you know, this isn't we're not here to talk about the the pros and cons of what it all means and and how many T Twenty leagues they are. But I think it, what it's meant is that more players are able to earn a better living from it, and therefore we are creating more players at a top level. Um, you can see that. But by the fact that we have these conversations and, you know, Paterano is bowling two overs where pa, a pa, I suppose the equivalent was, was Malinga in 2014. There was no match that he's ever playing where he isn't bowling himself out, right? But now suddenly we have we have choices and options. And actually, I think Sanath's role isn't necessarily, for 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 the two players that you highlighted, for Paterano and Tichina, necessarily to make sure that they are most happy to contend because almost they're... they're it's becoming a bit more like European football where their kind of stock and trade is going to be playing these franchise leagues. And then when they come into the side, I think it's a bit of a horses for courses situation. And I, and I think Sanders only role really is only ever to be to wake up in the morning and make sure he's got the 11 best players playing that, playing the game that they, that can win so, and to get the most out of it. Where I but like, these are, but these are two different things. Okay. I, I, if you want to say that his only role yeah. is to pick the eleven best players, fair enough. 
but you're also saying he has given us the you know the the vibes the energy the the like because those are two different roles and i think he's good at one and not very good at the other but but this is what I'm saying. I, I think that the pool has expanded so much. Yeah. I think it, he he so he needs to create a vibe where everyone's come and play. Right? We don't want a situation where players are where Paterana at age 26 just goes, "Now I'm done. I'm just playing franchise <laughs> cricket now." Right? We don't want that situation. That is the worst thing that could happen to us. Right? But he needs to create a situation where um, players players think that if they play well, they can get into the side. I think in the years gone by, I don't think that's necessarily been a, a situation with, with Sri Lanka. We've seen players just totally fall out with, with coaches. Um, I can remember, was it uh, Barnaker having to put up a big old Facebook post to, to talk about Mickey Arthur not picking him because he was unfit or whatever. But, uh, well, I, I, I think we're a little bit kind of moved on from that. But I think it, like, we're, we're, we're potentially in a situation where come the IPL and PSL are being played at the same time this year. There's going to be well north of 11 Sri Lankan cricketers playing franchise cricket mm -hmm. in Pakistan and India at that point. Um, There's a T10 league in Sri Lanka as well. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so, like, he's he's going to really, like, we're, we're at a stage where I think the talent pool is almost too deep to for everyone to be kind of as satisfied with, with the white ball game. I don't know if the way this is all heading is that Sri Lanka going to have to end up with a with an individual white ball coach and Sam just looks after the test side. I, also I think that's like... probably the way forward, right? Like having and, a separate uh, yeah. coach for each each format. And or I the feel two a different bit like things. He, um, he has backed players in a way. Like I know that we were upset that Wiki came in and got one game, but at least he's been like consistently a part of squads. And it feels like Willala Gay has been more consistently a part of squads. And uh, I mean, I thought that he's handled the Kusal situation in tests well, where a lot of people would have just discarded him and he's found a new role that he's more confident in. Vanders again is someone who seems to have been like backed to be around the squad permanently. Permanently. So I think it's it's nuanced and it's difficult, isn't it? I'm sounding like I'm Sanath's number one fan, which <laughs> I, uh, I am not necessarily. I do have drawbacks. And I think, you know, that this is the guy who picked Ramith Rambuquela when he was a selector. So I think there's always going to be uh, a whiff of partisanship along the way. But I think that there's a lot of things that are going right. I think when it comes to that like a lot of people also i think a lot of the criticism also comes from the fact that he's had a previous tenure as selector mm -hmm. and there were so many problems during that period right like with the number of players that were selected and rotated and all of that so i think some of the criticism is coming from that as well where you kind of you've almost seen this before and you don't kind of want to be too optimistic about it we, in, t in terms of like the players like Vikramasinghe and Mahish and stuff, the only thing I hope is that the communication is there, that they are told why they are not playing. Because to me, I think you have to be flexible, right, with the players that you have because you have so many options. In that sense, I do agree with what Mark was saying in terms yeah. of like having specific players for specific roles in specific conditions like right? you can't say oh these seven players will definitely play you have that kind of flexibility and to a degree i would say that sri lanka do have that kind of pool right now right in terms of particularly in terms of bowlers you have the options where you can maybe go four spinners or you can have three fast bowlers right and we saw that in the in the test that Sri Lanka won in England as well, right? Everyone was like, why are you leaving Prabhat Jayasuriya out? He's been so prolific. But Sanat Jayasuriya is probably one of the only people who could drop that guy and, you know, yeah. not get much criticism afterwards because he's that kind of, he's looked at in that sort of way, right, in Sri Lanka. I, I, I also think that it kind of goes back to something we talked about a little, right, almost right at the beginning, where it's, we don't, no one ever comes out and tells us what these people's roles actually are. Mm -hmm. Like, who we know, and basically we know this from us not just digging about and annoying various press officers at, at SLC. 
Thank you, Prasanna. Um, where <laughs> we know that you know they've got this fast bonus school. They have people who look after who work with specific batters. We know there is a structure for kind of the A team and developing players and emerging players, um, but no one ever really comes out and talks about it. Apart from occasionally when you get those kind of insets into the, the, into the interesting broadcast where you see thing about the, the top, top. A team and stuff is like I, what I would like to know is is this a system like the A team and emerging teams are getting a lot of tours and a lot of games right even the on the women's side right you you've got under 19s traveling to Australia you've got a lot of fixtures is this something that was put into place while Mahela was kind of Mahela and Tom Modi were handling the um, kind of the the structure or are these new developments because we're seeing the fruits of it now. Yeah. But it's not a new uh, thing, right? Like the Super Fours were introduced a while back. Super Fours for women were introduced, uh, I think, last season. So, like you're seeing more developed players coming out now, but the work has been do been yeah. kind of building up to that for a year or so, I would say. And yeah, how streamlined I, that whole system is. Yeah. I did hear that um, Jehan Mubarak is now the analyst, right? And he's been doing oh, all the under-19 stuff. I don't know if he's still working as the under-19 stuff while being the analyst for the main team. But if so, that's a kind of good indication that things are all quite sort of working together as one rather than being distinct bodies. I think Dom's point earlier was really good that uh, it's going to be very telling what kind of team he lines up when the ODI side plays away and goes to New Zealand in the new year. Like if Kamindu is still batting at eight in a team full of part-time spinners away from Sri Lanka, I think we can all agree that like that is not a yeah. good sign. So that for me feels like a kind of litmus test how they go about uh, approaching white ball games away from Sri Lanka. I, th I think too, the thing that Estelle brought up of and, and Mark about horses for courses. I'm all for that. But the thing I'm worried about losing is that if the courses are 60% of the time spin courses, 80%, you know, probably 80% yeah. of the time, right? It, you have this stable of fast bowlers and you can't just expect them to show up in Australia. Okay, go do your thing. Because as cricketers based in Sri Lanka, where are they getting their exposure Right? Are you going to be totally dependent on league cricket to give them exposure to different types of situations? And maybe with a Patarana, you you can depend on that because he is so in demand. Mm -hmm. But someone like Dilshan Madushanka, where he's at home, he's working at home. How do you how do you prepare him? Right. And the other thing that worries me is with the fast bowling stocks. I don't know that we're using them properly. Right. Like we didn't see Chimira or Kumara around we saw Asita fernando being preferred right this sort of medium like fast medium pacer or as the 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 pace option right so i think even though there is that like really rich pool of talent right we have ishan malinga i would he's someone i would love to see mm. in the squad he really really has looked um excellent so that's what I'm kind of curious about. Should Asita Fernando be playing three formats as a fast bowler? I don't think he should. Um, so for me, it's it's particularly some of the talent that we've cultivated, like the fast bowling talent, I want to see that used. And then the other thing, and these are more specific points rather than like ideological points, is like um, hitting, right? Right now, when we bat nine deep, hitting is deprioritized. But there are going to be some parts of the world where you're going to have to have a few hitters. You're going to have to have a few people go after it, right? And what positions do you put those players in? Someone like Wanindu Hasaranga as a batter, right? We, we saw him promoted to a floater role, and it didn't work out. But that, I think, is okay because it's such a critical role to play. And I think it's a really difficult role to play. You can't expect your floating hitter to give you 50s every match. But if once every five or six matches they pervert, per, like provide a match-turning knock, that's successful, right? So I don't like the fact that he's batting an eight or like when we're um, 150 for two in the 15th over, it's, you know, he doesn't come out. He should be the one that comes out. You want to let him succeed and grow into that role. So for me, those are the two places where 
that I think are one important to how Sri Lanka fares in white ball cricket, their, the health of their fast bowlers, and two, their ability to hit something that we know has been a problem. And I think we do have, we're starting to get some of the players like Chimindu, like Danura Kalupahana, who can hit, right? Um, and you want to see that nurtured so that the game can go forward. And I agree winning is important, but like those are the parts of the game that I'd like to see Sanath pay more attention to. And maybe it's just my my sort of, is Sanath trying to recreate 90s cricket? Thing? In terms of the fast bowling, right? I think if you look at international teams that have been successful, you'll see that like it's the fast bowling that they've really kind of nailed, right? You look at Australia, they've got Hazelwood, Stark, Cummins, who've like carried that bowling unit for years. Sure, they have Adam Zampa and you'll have the, like you'll have a really good spinner and Sri Lanka do already have two really good spinners, right? Yeah. Um, but it's fast bowling that has enabled a lot of teams like India to be successful overseas. Um, it's not, like, if you look at, if I take India in test cricket, the early 2000s, they had, they always had the best batting lineup on the planet, right? They always yeah. had the best batters. They had Sachin, Ganguly, Dravid, VVS, all those players. They still couldn't find success until they built, they prioritized having a good fast bowling unit. And then you see the overseas wins rolling in, right? I know I'm saying this at the moment when they've just lost <laughs> to a series at home. But like, if you look at teams that have been successful, you will see that very often they have had a good fast bowling unit like England 2019 to whatever that period that they were successful in white ball mm -hmm. cricket who did they have they had Jofra they had was it Plunkett um, Plunkett they had uh, Ben Stokes bowling at probably his best right they they had those fast bowlers that unit that five six seven fast bowlers who were doing really well and if you look at Sri Lanka as well our success has come because You've got Vishwa, you've got Asita, you've got Kasun Rajita, who have been good consistently, mm -hmm. right? And like, it's at the moment just test cricket, but that's where the success, like, it's kind of the thing that closes the loop, right? To mm -hmm. how you become a successful team. So when you've built that kind of core, you don't want to let that slip away from you, right? Because you've, you've got potentially one of the best kind of pools of fast bowlers across formats and like Asita I know I, I don't want him to play limited overs cricket only for the reason that I want to protect him for test cricket because yeah. he's that good right so like you have players who can play instead of him you've got good enough players who can be good at limited overs cricket you don't want to see a situation where Asita plays limited overs cricket for two years and then by the 2026 World Cup you have to he's injured or you don't feel like he's a good fit and then you have to suddenly like push someone else into that situation and get them to um, kind of do the job for you right yeah it, it's it's interesting right because we're, we're probably with our fast bowling stocks more than any other type of cricketer it feels like the players just go missing for for quite yeah. a while don't doesn't it it's it's like Dilsha and we don't know if they're injured, right? Like yeah, Kumara and yeah. Tamira. Like, yeah. I don't know whether they're injured. We don't know. Um, Madhushanka's, like, international stock has fallen quite a lot over the past mm. 12 months without playing very much cricket at all. Mm. You seem to see him for, like, play one T20 and he might go for yeah. 40. Um, but, like, you know, he, this was a guy who was getting a big IPL contract this time last mm. year. And I think we've all said off air that we feel like that might not come again this year. And that's a bit worrying. Uh, again, Kumara, I thought that some of his best performances have come in ODI cricket. And I don't think he's yeah. played in ODI since the World Cup. Uh, so, yeah, I, I do have to say that it feels like Asitha has played every match under Sanad <laughs> yeah. And he's showed, I mean, I know I get the burnout point, but he does seem like a hardy dude. And I think uh, that's what Sanat loves as well, right? He wants yeah, those like characters as well. Um, and I, I, I think Asitha has shown a higher ceiling in white ball cricket than I mm. thought he had, to be fair. Right. So, um you know, it's, I guess, all these things, that they're, they're complicated and it's spinning wheels. But I do totally agree that it feels like, especially in fast bowling terms, there are resources which aren't quite being used. Yeah. 
I, I used to always think that we should just always play Cuss and Rajatha because every, what always happens is you start the series <laughs> and Paul Cuss is either at home or, or carrying the water. And by the end of it, he's like ended up being our, our kind of bowling half the overs because everyone else has got injured. I mean, the injury crisis around fast bowlers, for the moment, touch wood, seems to be getting better, right? So maybe it, it, we can kind of spread our resources a little bit more and have a bit think a bit bit deeper about how we use people, right? Because, I, again, I was going to say, currently, as far as I'm aware, I don't think any of our kind of major fastball bowlers are injured, but is Kamara injured? Is Benura injured? Um, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure. Pat, is Patron injured at the moment? I can't... No. Wait. I don't, I don't think, think so. so. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and it, like... What do you guys think about Paterana? We're getting slightly off Sanath now, but does Paterana have a future as an ODI cricketer? I think that he should, should. but obviously, given how injury prone it is, it's got to be something that's managed really delicately, right? Yeah, and right. especially with all the like the franchise stuff, right? I would assume at some point CSK is going to offer him kind of a multi-team deal of some sort yeah, right do you think he'll end up playing and, at like Joburg Super Kings this yeah, year yeah right like, that's the natural yeah. progression for a player like him they've already kind of invested so much in him and retained him ahead of a, a mega auction it, it was kind of I mean why wouldn't you retain him right but like yeah. they've shown the that they foreign player right yeah they, why wouldn't they want um, somebody like him to represent them in different leagues as well and then you've got like his commitments if Sri Lanka, once Sri Lanka start the T10 league as well, surely Sri Lanka cricket will want him to feature in both the LPL and that, right? So yeah. that's that would be a concern to me. Like, you know, how do you manage him? Because fast bowlers right. are generally injury prone. He started very, very early, right? Like, he, I mean, he he's what, 20, is he 23, 24? Um, no, I don't he's, think he's even that old. I think he's 22, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so like already Crazy. he's had a lot of load on his body, right? So I, I guess like managing him is also going to be really important. I wonder if you, you maybe take like an NBA route and you have a personal kind of, you have yeah. one physio for yourself, like keep him healthy. He's actually still 21, which makes oh. it even great. Yeah, and I mean, if I was a 21-year-old getting paid the kind of money he's earning, I'd be a physio, a chef, and... Yeah. So, someone well, to just massage my muscles. Every I'm time still waiting for him to like do the Malinga slash Dhoni where he comes back at the start of one IPL season and he's just like hench. He's put on like all <laughs> kinds of muscle and he's like Patirana Hulk. Well, we no, see him try to bat, right? He's, he, that's yeah. His next, that, his next thing. Was How is he? I, I think the other thing about Patirana is like because you have the stock of fastballers, you don't need to use him all the time. You mm. can give him one game in a series. I think actually to to one of the points that we were talking about earlier, like when they go to foreign soil, like that'll be a test. But actually New Zealand's team that they're fielding for this series is definitely not their strongest side. I think I, I pulled it up. Let me, let me, re like it's, you know, there's no Kane Williamson. Uh, Mitchell Santner is, is captaining the squad. Um, they're, they have three batters. Henry Nichols, Tim Robinson, Will Young. They've got Santner, Bracewell, Chapman, Josh Clarkson, who I don't know who he is, Zachary Fultz, Dean Foxcraft, and then Glenn Phillips, right? They've got Lucky Ferguson, Ish Sodi, and Jacob Duffy. He, so this is not New But a Zealand. lot of guys who get runs against us, right? Like Phillips. Yeah, a lot of guys. Yeah, Glenn Phillips. <laughs> but no Mitchell, no yeah. Conway, no Rachin, no... Yeah. Um, They've all got Williams nightmares of their last trip to Sri Lanka. Yeah, right? exactly. They're too scared. Yeah. Like, but um, at the same time, right? Like, this could be a chance to say, "Hey, why don't we try some guys that try something out here and see how how they go?" And it doesn't um, matter, right? Like, exactly. It in the matter. grand scheme of things, it doesn't matter at all. Like, there's no ODI championship, nothing. So. I know, I know yeah. there were some whispers of this online and I really hope they do it because there was talk of some of the players who play test cricket just going to South Africa. Mm. I think that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Next week, the end of this all week. The, all the test that's a really players good idea. getting straight. I agree. Yeah. The only thing to keep in mind is ODI world rankings do slightly matter. Mm. 
there for qualification. If they don't want to qualify, have to qualify for the next World Cup, they have to be in the top nine, um, which I think they're right now they're sixth. So they're not in, in a bad place for that. But for the 2026 World Cup, there's absolutely nothing they have to worry about because they're automatic, they're automatic bid. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, I understand wanting to play players, but I also think to a sales point, right? 18 months, three years out from a tournament, this is where you find out what your young players are made of, right? You can always go back to KJP. You know what KJP is going to give you, right? Like there's no. Surely like, in three years time, KJP is done in, in ODI. <laughs> Surely. I don't know. I do, I do agree, and like I think we're looking at Kamindu now and seeing him having mm. sat on the sidelines for three years and said, what could he have done over that period if he was introduced yeah. sooner? And, you know, the same thing's going to start happening to guys like Nuanidu and Crosspole if they don't get chances to show what they can do, right? The, the only yeah. thing I'll say about Kamindu in kind of Sanis defence is, is that surely we kind of know what he can do and actually, we kind of can't be in a situation where it's like, give the younger guys a chance. So kind of, if you're going to bring Sadira in, then he's kind of got to come in and, and bat a bit. And have and it kind of doesn't matter if Kamindu ends up facing three balls at the end of the, mm-hmm. the innings because he kind I, of bats enough of other... I, I, kind mean, of, like, I kind of agree, but like, who's got the highest ceiling out of Sadira and yeah. the game? Yeah. yeah. I think and also, all, isn't it months, like really important to nail down six seven because that's yeah. where we consistently have a problem like we don't have people who can hit the ball and then like yeah. you ke- you keep bringing in players who are actually like all like early 2000 number fours yeah. and you stick them all over that batting lineup it becomes exactly. a problem but but and, i also and- like and i know this is a lot of what we said about the whole the, the state of the pitches as well i think part of the problem is is that when you have these really turning pitches that our oppositions can't bat on and that our our boys are really good at playing spin on, you're never getting down. Like, yeah, Sometimes. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, but yeah, I think the other thing is like we saw, w- we need some dynamism, right? We need people like to play different roles. I think Potham can provide that. One thing that is slightly concerning me is that He's gone a touch more into his shell in the, in the one day game than say you know ten months ago when he's scoring double hundreds and going hell for leather. And I think some of their players play better when you tell them you give them a license to just go rather than Kusal. say okay you need to, yeah right mm-hmm. Kusal. We saw how effective he was in that third ODI. He just turned that he made that match a match right because it wasn't going to be one with the rain and the weather and. When you have, at least if you have, like if you're playing six guys who are top order bats in the top six slots, you need to at least tell a couple of them to just go, right? You got to mm-hmm. tell Kusal to go. I will say, I, I think at the risk of, one one of the things people have accused me of is being negative. I want to say that I actually am very positive about the Sri Lankan team's outlook, given the resources that they have. They have the makings of a really good side if they play it smartly. And that's what makes it so frustrating is I, I see is that that I think that there are times where maybe um, Sonnet's leadership is getting in the way of Kamindu batting at four and making that position his own and learning how to play that. Right. Because if he's coming in at eight, like I don't really understand what he's learning, what skill set he's learning, because surely he can't think I'm going to be the number eight batter forever i mean hopefully not power hitter Uh, yeah exactly power hitter and the guys who are you know what do we get from jonathan leonage bowling six overs of his medium pacers like that's like that's just not going to like that's not going to work i mean like whatever whatever way we feel about the pitches like that's not successful in any in any scenario well, yeah, and Charith and Kamindu bowling like as many overs as they are. Yeah. Like, that's not going to work outside of Sri Lanka. And Kamindu, yeah. I mean, he's faced 315 balls in ODI cricket and made 150. And yeah. he's already 26. So, like, you know, you've got to start giving him that experience. I could see if they think that he's the best player to bat at six, I could just about make my peace with that. But him batting seven and eight, I don't think is... Um, just well, I don't think it's just not right. 
I think when you look at Hasaranga's career thus far, and even Kusil Mendes' career thus far, too much, too mu- much of their career has been spent trying to fix a hole opposed to yeah. playing to their to their strengths. Mm-hmm. And we need Sri Lanka going to do well in major tournaments. We have our best players playing when they're most effective. Um, yes. And I. Just- I still think Hasaranga is a floater, especially in T20s. Yeah. 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 That should be a um, like, and I was thinking about when I think Dom, you were talking earlier about it, and it reminded me of like the fact that Glenn Maxwell is someone who's like had long periods where he hasn't made runs. So I think he went a whole season for Punjab Kings where he didn't hit a six yeah. in the IPL, but then he comes in and he can play the kind of innings that no one else in that Australia 11 can play. And Winindu has a bit of that feel for me in this Sri Lanka T20 side, and that I do think if he's stuck down at eight and nine, and that's the end of like him as a sort of floating all-rounder it's not necessarily a good thing yeah, yeah I, I think mark you're you're right that you want uh, you, the way you said it i couldn't agree more you want sri lanka's best players playing the type of cricket that is best for them to play right yeah. like if you're sticking crystal mendes and say okay you're gonna bat at three and you're gonna bat like a traditional number three you're obviously going to be disappointed Right at this point, you're a fool if you go in and say you're going to bat number three and you're going to be like a Kane Williamson. That's not he isn't he isn't that player. But what you want from him is to play these great innings, right? These match turning innings, and it doesn't really matter or if he you know I'd much rather him get out like third ball than go one for fifteen trying to kind of mm-hmm. bat his way into the innings. Um, Charis Thessalonka is someone who's grown in that five role because he's made it his own and it's clear that he's batting where he bats best. Um, Patham Nisanka again, right? So I think that's the key is saying, okay, who is going to take that six role and make it their own and play their best cricket in it? Um, and there can be different ways to, to slice things up, right? Like, um, India doesn't really have, like, yes, they have Hardik Pandya who can finish, but, they score a lot of their runs at the top of the innings, right? In in 2023, they went hard early, right, to try to maximize that power play. There are different ways to getting to good ODI scores. But in order to do that, you got to do what you were saying, Mark. You have to have everyone playing a role they feel very comfortable playing. It's um, – it's – when I look at kind of Shrunk as a white ball team at the moment, I'm more, more talking about the T20s, I think, than the ODIs. Um, because for me, the ODIs are too, like too far away for World Cup mm-hmm. to really conceptualize, like, do whatever you want. Um, pick, pick the batting numbers up the hat. Uh, but it feels like you've got Patham and Kusa at the top. That's fixed. That's been there now for what, 18 months, is it? Uh, maybe even longer, two actually. Years? Two years now, yeah. Two years, yeah. And it feels like actually those two have developed a really good partnership. Charith at five developed a really good partnership. And then it just feels like everything else is slightly chaotic. And you're like, it doesn't need to be like that. Yeah. We've got really top quality players. We've got good players in positions. We've seen from the Charith and the Patham experiment almost that if you put plug players in, you give them a finite roles when it comes to batting, that they will react to it and they'll they'll kind of make it the home. You've got this situation yeah. with Kamindu where he's coming through now or he's he's almost like fully developed as a, as a player and you're like, everyone in the whole world is talking about him as one of the best batters in the world. And us lot, we still can't figure out where, where, where to put him. And it, I just don't want it to be this case where we end up looking back at it and it's like, oh, we kind of wasted it. We kind of, yeah. you know, we didn't quite get it right. Um, then, you know, Hasaranga, for me, he needs to be, we need to try and get him to a place where he's he's facing more balls. I think that floating role is, is ideal for him. And then, you know, we all know I'm a big fan of Willala Gay just because I think that we've seen him mm-hmm. play really crucial innings and, and do really crucial bits should really, in my mind, be definitely starting um in the 11 for the uh for the world cup which you know is 18 months away now in real terms right right um so we need to be getting him in and we need to figure out where his best place is is batting is it you know just under um one e is it could he does he does he need to be a floater as well because you know that he's got gears with his batting right we've seen we've seen that happen as well um who who else do we need you know who's coming in at three is kjp in it is barnica in it like Mm -hmm. what where Bardic is going to be what 35 36 come yeah. come the next world cup like is he going to be someone that we can rely on what is going on with Sharlika we cut like he's I think yeah, he's characters he as well right like if you look at the the players that you mentioned like Patumne Sankar 
uh, he he got a lot of criticism in his first like one and one and a half years of cricket right he was making the runs he wasn't making quick enough but we've seen how he's developed as a player and i think that shows great character right both formats yeah. mm -hmm. the way he's kind of been able to change his game doesn't like really make much noise about it but he's changed and evolved and made himself into like it's almost like he's done the research on what he needs to do right yeah. similarly charit asalank i don't know if you guys recall but like that series in england his debut series he did not look like he was ready for international cricket yeah. did he he looked like he was scared he looked like he wasn't sure what he was doing when he was facing pace and now he's like like Lasit Malinga tweeted, like he's arguably the best number five in international cricket, right? He's at yeah, least yeah. amongst the top three to four in that position. And he's grown into that position as well. And when we talk about Bellalage, I think he's already shown glimpses that he has the character, like that temperament. And, you know, people will talk about skill and talent, right? If only the most talented made it to the top, then it would be very easy to pick out teams and very easy to pick out winners, right? India, Australia, England would win everything. Um, and like, you know, it, it cricket would be such a predictable game, but it's not just talent and, um, uh, you know, skill. It is temperament as well. And Velalage, I think as a batter, is being underutilized in that way. Yeah. I You're, think I 100% I, I agree with Estelle. Like, this generation of, of Sri Lankan cricketers are incredibly smart and they learn the game quickly. Like Wella, it, you know, he was bowling at like 80 kph. He now can bowl up to 100 kph, which is what you need to do to be a good limited over spinner. Um, he has that craft. Dikshana, right, mm -hmm. talking about talent and, and like physical capabilities, he has admitted he's not the most talented. He's not the most physically capable. By God, he's like learned so much about the game. He's always changing. He's developing new things. But the runner, same thing, the amount of improvement he's had. And this is so, and someone like Nuan Tushara, right? Sidelined for a long time and he, you know, figured it out. So I think that's what's so exciting is that you do have self starters in this team who are doing the extra work and figuring out what kind of player do I need to be? Even Chris Almendis, who we criticize, right? Like, in the T20 format, he has figured out what he needs to be, how he needs to play, and they've they've done that so well. And and Mark, I think Wella is kind of the litmus test, right? If you give him a role, you could even slot him if you if you can turn him into a, a usable top order batter, like you automatically have this flexibility where you have a uh, all rounder batting in the top order plus Dikshana and Hasaranga plus your fast bowlers, right? Like, and why not see what he can do at three, right? Like, what what do we lose seeing what he can do at three in this series, say, against New Zealand? Like, if he can score at 130, 140, pat, you pat yourself on the back and say, okay, well, let's back him for the next 18 months and see if he can be that match winner for us. I, so I think in, in general terms, I and me and Dom touched on this in the last Merle End pod that we did, is I feel like the way SLC select the sides almost is like there's players are like clumped in tiers. So there's like the top tiers that they think have a, a, a kind of world, I, either are world class or could be world class. Mm. And then there's a middle tier where they think that probably they're, ability in some ways limited might score runs at home probably not going to score too many away from home and then there's the bottom two kind of come in to like kind of fix particular gaps and, and particular um solve particular problems right and i think that the the reason why some players are considered the top tiers goes back to what estelle was saying where it's like mentally they're like post just their talent right and when you speak to any of the coaches who've been involved in youth cricket or developing any of the stronger players, the one they all speak about at the moment is Weller. They're just like, he's the guy who's like next level. He's the guy who can kind of win us win us games. Um, and I, I think some of our frustrations can, as fans can often be kind of like, why are these middle tier guys not getting a mm. upper, you know, why are they being pushed into the upper tier? But actually 
the people in and around the squads, the people who are working with them will know like these guys, their ceiling is here when mm-hmm. actually these guys, their ceilings like next level. I think potentially we're in a situation where if you, if you go back to like 2014, I think Schlug had like maybe kind of six or seven match winners. And then there was a situation developed where for various different reasons where we had maybe two or three match winners, but I think we might be in a situation where in kind of 18 months time, we could be back up to having kind of six or seven match winners in any given side. If not, actually think about it. I mean, potentially even more, right? Um, those players that can go and get you two wickets in the Nova, those players who can hit, you know, 50 or 30. That, like, that's what we need to be developing and need to be in a situation where when the time comes for it, we can get the best out of those players. What do you think, Nick? I feel like I haven't heard from you in a little while. I think we're already there at that stage where we've got six or seven match winners. I think you'd say that, like, the match winners aren't quite at the same extent, obviously, as, you know, a Sangha or a Mahela or a Murali or a Malinga in their prime. But I actually think that the pool of players who can do really big things is kind of as deep as it's ever been. Uh, and, yeah, I think that this squad across all three formats is in as good as a a good a place as I can remember it. I mean, like, and I know we can t- we talk a lot about pitches, etc. But I mean, on raw results, I mean, you look at what Sri Lanka did to New Zealand and how New Zealand have bounced back in India. You look at what the way they handled the West Indies on the whole, and the West Indies have just gone and breezed past. Uh, I mean, albeit a young England side last night. So, like, you know, I mean, uh, yeah, it's just I think the results are really, really promising, and I think that we all feel like Sri Lankan cricket is in a much better state than we did say uh, a year ago or six months ago. I think that the the trend is definitely in the right direction. Um, we put out a tweet, asked for people's comments. Should we go through some of those comments? That would be the nice yeah. present. That's, the yeah, that's a good thing for us to do. Right? Yeah. Uh, so Abdullah said, SJ, as in Sanath and SLC, should try out new young players for the upcoming series, follow the footsteps of England, India, Aussies, etc., without depending on the same players. So we'd have backup for everyone. The only thing I will say is, I mean, India and England seems to be in a bit of a slump at the moment. Um, so we don't want to follow those immediate footsteps. I think we kind of, I feel like in our conversation, we kind of covered this off a little bit, right? Um, Yeah, and I think we all hard agree, right? That now's the time for experimentation, that we'd like to see some of these young guys getting more opportunities. Yeah. Yeah. The other kind of aspect to this that I think is really important is, and I know I've been banging the drum about this for, I feel like for, for, feels like my whole life, like a missionary saying this, is that we just need to do what we can to get as many of our players playing in the top franchise leagues. Yeah. Right. Um, And I think that probably includes a lot of reform of the Lunker Premier League. Obviously, I still think it's the best league in the world, but at the moment, it felt like when it first started, it was a bit of a shop window. Right. And, I don't think the most recent iteration of it was much of a shot window for the players, mm. right? But you see, with like Newman Thushra is one of those is a great example of a player. Did well in the LPL, gets in and around the kind of national team, but then gets an uh, an IPL mm. contract, which like, let's be honest, most of us weren't expecting to happen. Kind of, you know, doesn't you know, isn't pulling up trees or anything in there, but just learns his craft, learns his trade, learns what it is to be a professional cricketer, is in and around, you know, a a highly professional setup. And then you can see his development and his trajectory from there, right? Um, So I do, I like, I think we might be in a situation where there's not going to be enough fixtures for Sri Lanka to play to kind of develop yeah. all the young players that we have, right? We, we You see that with Australia, you see that with India, and you see that with England. So the situation's got to be, it's how can we give these guys more of an opportunity so that when they are called upon... And, it, you know, it, you know, Kamindu, when you think about it, it's actually quite late um, by the time he kind of makes his... Not his debut, but a, bit, a bigger impact. Though we've kind of been talking about it for a little while. Admittedly, he's a player who's always played no... Um, franchise cricket and i assume in the next 12 months that will that will change but yeah. there's also a, a dichotomy here right between batters and bowlers i think because the bowlers have gone away and gotten their chances to become match winners by playing overseas 
the batters kind of need to be selfish and do that in the international fixtures because they don't get as many opportunities um, because I guess Sri Lankan bowling is seen as something unique internationally. Your Thikshinas, your Hasarangas. Speaking of which, Hasaranga dearly needs to go back to the IPL and have a, a have some time there. Um, the more time he gets away from PL Wichitunga, the, <laughs> the better, in my opinion. Because um, I think after he had that big, big season, the second season in the IPL, he really looked an improved bowler. And I think going back and playing those best players in the world and figuring out how to get them out, not just on Sri Lankan pitches, is it, is huge for him. Because I think our bowlers become world class when they go overseas. Our batters don't get as many opportunities, so they need those games to do it. Like right, Potham, as Estelle said, Potham got to play, Charith got to play. And they made themselves world class by playing those matches. Cricket on screen writes: Is he suffering the syndrome all SL coaches face off? Play to your strengths and keep the upper part happy. Also, three things you think Sana should implement, considering SA, ODI, WC, WRT pitches and team combination. I, I have actually a. Uh thought about the first part of that question in the the trying to keep people happy and see that is that is an issue that plagues a lot of i think domestic teams in sri lanka in terms of schools level and club level in in various sports you're given very like it's you succeed or you leave right so there is i think there there has to be some element of it where you just want to succeed you just want success because if you don't win immediately and you don't see success immediately then your job is going to be short-lived and we've seen that with past like international coaches as well right there is no room to have a four-year plan two years is like an eternity but that I I think I don't I won't say that hundred percent of that is the case with Sanat, but surely there is that inkling as well where you you that success means that it guarantees you more time in charge. Yeah. But I think if anyone's got a slightly longer leash, it's yeah. Sanat, right? And I think if anyone <laughs> can go and tell SLC to like fuck off, that it's Sanat. Uh, like I think he has uh, he's in a unique position where he carries almost more sway than anyone else and so he mm. can uh do things i think i think i've always thought that since he became interim coach he wanted to be the coach full time and so yeah. that winning was particularly important in those first few series mm. uh but now i think it is the time where he can start to build a plan and that you've got to be looking to, towards the world cup because like at this point, you've got to say winning bilateral series, it doesn't mean a lot apart from the confidence that it's bringing the team. Right. Because just, again, Estelle brought this up. We've won nine consecutive ODI bilateral series. And then we get hyped up, we get hyped up, we get excited. And then there's the letdown at the World <laughs> Cup. Right. We won the Asia Cup. We do well in the Asia Cup, let down at the World Cup. So that's, I think, for us, we get excited. But what what's really going to give people that thrill is making a deep run into yeah. an international yeah. tournament and, and sort of that sustainability. And, and that's kind of like when we think of Sri Lanka as a world-class side, it's performing at a world-class level at the top tournaments, because actually we didn't really do that well in bilateral tournaments yeah. when we were at our peak. It was, we peaked at the right time yeah. for those international tournaments. We had some special, brain plan that Mahela has cooked up that he's going to unleash on the other teams in the world or whoever it was. So that that's that's kind of like, so the winning is important now to really kind of put his mark on it. Sunath needs to engineer that World Cup special. And, that, and that's what gives opportunities for players at in franchise leagues as well, right? Like, no, you, you think any IPL coaches were watching the West Indies Sri Lanka uh series no right if you're playing india maybe there will there'll be a couple of scouts watching but at world cups at the that's the highest level right if you can perform there and that's why you know dilshan madhusanka got a bid last time it's because that one delivery to rohit sharma right he doesn't <laughs> bowl that he's probably not not getting a contract with mumbai indian so that's yeah. where i i wonder actually and i mean i thought about this for 
for years that there should be you know mental health support for t for players right psychologists performance psychologists with the team and sri lanka cricket did i think post a um vacancy a few months ago for a sports psychologist so they are I, from their point of view i think they are also looking at those things right maybe the world cup thing is a mental block where you're you're going you you're performing so well and you're showing so much promise and then none of that happens at the world cup like even for yeah. the women right this time around like mm. all that promise and all those performances against good teams and you didn't see that at the world cup so maybe it is a mental block that hopefully they're trying to address the common yeah. the common thing about world cup recent world cup performances even even well actually the women i wouldn't i wouldn't include them in this and even bilateral performances the one common thing is always losing that first game mm. we always start badly we just always start badly and, and then know, it's downhill right yeah i know culturally we all like to turn up late and stuff like that but <laughs> i think at a world cup it, it it becomes too much right because suddenly all the pressure comes on you and also if yeah. you look at this look at the our squad because we're sri lanka everyone like people ex- there's an expectation from other from cricket commentators um about us anyway because we produce good players and then at the moment we've got quite unique bowling lineup as well so i think our the expectation and pressure comes in on it i also think the our home fans and rightfully so i'm not this i'm not saying this is a negative i think there's a lot of expectation as well so if you lose that first game suddenly it's a it feels like an avalanche right and then so if you if you go back look at the the world uh, the t20 world cup this year it's like you lost that game was that pitch was a disaster for us in New York, and we got mm-hmm. the toss all wrong. You lost that. Never going to go to a game again now. After yeah, that. <laughs> done. and then um, and then suddenly you your next match is your biggest rivals, right? Um, and, and there's then, so much pressure on it. And there's so yeah. much pressure on it. And and that's the game you're thinking. Even now, I think that could have gone any way. Right? I, I, yeah. Every yeah. result. Kind of, mm. and that basically became a knockout, didn't it? Because of the yeah. first game against South Africa. Yeah, yeah. And this I, is the other thing: is like we to to go back to the World Cups. Like we've come in thinking that we've had a world class bowling lineup, only to be kind of found out when we go to these other pitches. Not so much twenty twenty four because strange pitch situation, but. You know, in 2023, we get smashed around by mm-hmm. South Africa. And I came in thinking, okay, the bowling is the strength of this team. They've got a whole variety of bowlers who can do different things. 2022, right, um, when Indu, right, we thought, okay, here, we have a world-beating spinner. But then on Australian pitches, he wasn't able to do the things that we come to expect him to do. So, like, that's one thing that, in addition to that losing of the first match, the mental block, Losing to Bangladesh, right? A team we regularly beat in bilaterals convincingly. You're not supposed to say the name, no. though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the other team, the other Tiger team. Um, yeah. Oh, let's let's cool. call the Big Cat team. We're not like. <laughs> the, uh, yeah. But yeah, it's for me, it's. There's a lot revealing when you go on the world stage and you're not quite ready. You're not like that's the other thing. I guess maybe that first game always shows you it's like there's they're not quite ready. They're they're slightly undercooked. There's something they haven't considered. Like when Australia turns up, you know they're ready to play. Right? India for the first nine matches, you know they're ready to play. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk about the second part of this uh, this question? Three things you think Sanath should implement considering SA ODI WC. WRT pitches. I don't know what WRT stands for. <laughs> what WRT the... pitches. And team combination. World? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, oh, rest of the world? Something like that? W- uh, but how, but basically how the team should shape up with South Africa in yeah. mind. Yeah, right? like three yeah, things yeah. that we should, Sanat should implement. Yeah. Young players I, give opportunities to young players. That's I think I need to get get yeah. like I I if I could I'd be flying a flight right now from Colombo to to anywhere in South Africa and and drop our test team off there so they can get <laughs> used to the pictures as quickly as possible. South Africa just tore apart the the other guys. Yes. Um, 
<laughs> in the other guy's home. So what I thought was probably going to be quite a routine away series win. Obviously, Shrunk have never, never oh, had a routine Oh, we talked about the test team for South Africa. I thought we were talk, looking towards the ODI World, World Cup, Cup, right? Oh, oh, yeah, oh, right, 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 right. That's right. ODIWC. That's what that yeah, means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think especially Chamindu uh, playing lots of games mm, yeah. because we've seen it's easy to forget when you play watch a lot of T20 cricket, but all-rounders are really crucial in 50-over uh, cricket and especially seam bowling all-rounders. So that's one yep. for me. And my second one would be uh, starting to judiciously reintegrate Paterana into the ODI mm. setup. So it's not like, I mean, I'm not talking about him playing every ODI between now and 2027, yeah. but playing one here and there. So it doesn't get around to 2027 and we're like, let's throw him in. And he's suddenly bowling 10 overs every four or five days. And he doesn't necessarily ha have the body or the kind of bank of knowledge of how to bowl in different phases. Mm. Yeah, those are two. I don't really have a third off the top of my head. I kind of think it's a little bit too early to think too much about mm. it, and actually, you just want to kind of develop it because the worry yeah, is, that's is that you're 27, have... right? So, you yeah. have, yeah, so it's still a long way away. I mean, players will come in and out of form. The average player you'd expect come in and out of form three times between now and yeah. now, right? Well, yeah, you got to get your pacers ready. I think that that certainly is the thing that you need to do is have your pacers develop fitness, make sure you have a rigorous fitness plan for those pacers to keep them healthy for that World Cup. And uh, again, I agree with Nick totally. Develop pace all renders. The other person I, I bring up is Danura Kalupahana, again, who bowls some pace and, and um, can hit down the order. So I think that... and. You know, see how see which batters handle pace the best, right? You know, that's another thing you kind of got to identify. Yeah, uh, Lahindu Welgama has asked not a question, so he's not asked anything actually. Santa Ball <laughs> is not the most modern and best management, but he seems to be getting things done, and players look to be having fun and performing well. Obviously, a lot to improve in terms of selections and all, but I like what I see in Santa Ball. It's interesting. He said not in the most modern and best management. I'm not. I, I think the whole management question is quite interesting, right? Because obviously me and Nick live in England. And in England, Baz McCullum has managed to just persuade the people that winning matches doesn't matter, which is like the most <laughs> hilarious thing in the world. Uh, you know, sometimes I like, think like maybe I just really hated England and tried to like sabotage them from the inside. But I mean, like they've just picked Jacob Bethel for a test series who's like hasn't scored a first class century, averages 20 um, in first class cricket, if Sri Lanka did something like that, I mean, Sanath would be getting slated. Nick, they scored 780 runs in Pakistan, though. Who can forget <laughs> that? See, that's the thing with basketball is you just got to, once every three months, you got to have that performance that just is like, oh my God, basketball is changing test cricket. So that's, I, I think that's how he does it. I think, though, I have a slightly more positive outlook on basketball. I think it allowed them in the past, right? Allowed them to compete against teams which they had no right competing against. For example, mm -hmm. that, that Australia series, right? Which yeah. was so close. Australia on paper is a far, far better seat, better team, right? They should have won that series easily. But like this whole atmosphere and environment and the mental thing they created in that, you know what? We're going to, that's the only way they compete. There's no other way they come, like playing normal test cricket they're getting blown away in that series, right? So, like, yeah. it, it's also kind of a culmination of, okay, you you put this in your heads and then you have three or four players who really click and have a crazy series and suddenly you have some really good results. And then you don't want to go away from that because it's given you results. But then it becomes, like, the extreme. Like, attacking yeah. is not just playing cricket with intent, but just playing mad shots all the time. I, yeah, I, I, I think... Actually, what basketball was, what it tries to do is basically create the conditions. And we talked about this a little bit earlier for effectively Joe Root, Stokes to basically play to the best of their ability. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of everything else is almost like decoration around it. And now he's got Brooke and, and Smith who are kind of coming through as well. And I mean, and the, the other guys are allowed to sort of operate without fear of failure. Yeah. yeah. 
I feel like Sandball is like taking some elements from Davball or Delete Ball or Arjuna Ball and Baz Ball and kind of blending them into uh, one thing. <laughs> but what, my question is, what risks is this team taking? And do the players really have no concern about being dropped like Dikshana? I think in Sri Lanka, the- that's never going to be a reality, right? Yeah, because as soon as the management changes, you know things are going to change, and that those attitudes yeah. are not going to be the same. So that stability we, is something that we've never had. No, so like I was just thinking, I think uh, Andrew McDonald's contract got extended to twenty twenty six or something like that, and I think he's been there for the last seven years or something. And I was like, how many Sri Lankan coaches have we had in the last seven years? <laughs> he, Three, yeah, he, right? He would have been there since twenty. When did they? It was just before the last Ashes in Australia. They got four. Was it eighteen? Yeah, yeah. I think I don't four. know. But like that stability is not something you're going to have. No, you're not going to have a Sri Lanka like a coach for Sri Lanka staying on for six years, right? That's not going to happen. So, yeah. um, I think it's it's nearly impossible to keep, create an environment where players are not fearful of uh, yeah. getting dropped for bad performances. I I, I think the, yeah. When you compa- contrast it to to basketball in particular, it, you, you it basically you can't because there is so much more pressure on shrunken players because there's mm. just it just means more to shrunker yeah. than yeah. English like Ali Pope would would not have survived very long. like. Can you imagine uh, like Sri Lankan fans talking about Ali Pope? Yeah, D- Dan Lawrence <laughs> wouldn't wouldn't be able to walk out in public. I don't think if he was if he if he was Sri Lankan. He'd, I mean, those Sri Lankan fans play. are not not oh. aggressive in person. I don't think. No, that's like, true. They're very oh, chilled yeah. out. Yeah. <laughs> um, also, t- talking about coaches, I oft- often think just because he kind of just I suppose came up adjacent conversation. If uncles got to choose who the shrunken coach was, the outstanding <laughs> candidate would be JL. Just like because if you watch <laughs> the test and the way he the way he kind of discipline. reacts to his team and his discipline. That but is I, what I think Sanat people. is quite a strict guy as well he, there's no nonsense with him and the thing is like we've like we we've, we've kind of touched on it is that he gets what he wants he's not like a hathuru singha who would have to yeah. go through management to get some disciplinary reaction if he says this guy's i don't want him that guy's done for a period of time right like i mean i can drop some hints offline about incidences i've heard of but like with him there's no like he's also a no nonsense kind of guy, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. I think he's when got you, a bit of JL in him. Yeah. And, um, well, this is yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, Nick. No, I'm just. I was just going to say I'm low key and unashamed fan of JL's management style. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, the, the test is also so boring now that he uh, he's isn't a part. Yeah. Like, the best I do bit not want to watch the best bit about the second series happens. office when they go to Gaul, right? Like, yeah, yeah that was amazing. That's amazing because you don't really realize how difficult a place is almost until you hear those guys talk about it, right? Oh, and they so, had the toughest time, right? They they traveled to Sri Lanka when there was there were those oh, yeah. hour long like six hour long power cuts and no fuel to go anywhere, and they were yeah. basically stuck in their hotels. And then they would go out to restaurants and not have electricity. I I remember there were like videos of pat cummins in some restaurant in the dark right um <laughs> so they came at a really terrible time as well Deserved. but but pat cummins still looked good even in the bad lighting they were out there you know he just has the glow about him <laughs> that, uh, that everyone loves but yeah it's interesting because i don't know sonnet the disciplinarian is definitely a, a narrative but then there are these stories and maybe they're just trying to discredit Sanath about him staying up late at night during the 2024 World Cup drinking with uh, with people and, and, and things like that. So, and we know Sanath, well, you know. He could do that. Why not? Like, well, I 2024, think he's got a bit 20... of both like about him. I think he's a mate, yeah, but he's exactly. also yeah, like yeah, yeah, a star. Yeah, yeah. And you don't, you know, you don't want to get on the wrong side of him. Yeah, yeah. I, I said that I wanted Ravi Shastri to coach Sri Lanka, right? And I think there's an element of Salath is about as close to that as we're going to get, right? I think he's mm. probably more Shastri than JL, like in, in my opinion. But I don't know. I don't know because I don't know any of these people, right? <laughs> um, Harry, um, who I'm going to call a friend of the show because 
Uh, when I spoke to him once, he told me that his mum had actually carried me when I was a baby. Which was like, oh. <laughs> um, uh, does this brand of cricket seem sustainable given Schmunk is still in a rebuilding stage? <laughs> what is the brand, though? I think that's the next question. Like, that is the next I question. feel like I'm writing an English lit answer, but like, what is the brand? I think the brand is to be unashamedly Sri Lankan, right? And <laughs> like, like if, if, no, 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 because the brand is find a way, right? The brand is always find a way. It's like whatever's going on, just fucking fuck. Oh, shouldn't swear on this. Find a way. Right? Just figure out a way to do it. If it means playing eight spinners and <laughs> and Madhu Shankar bowling two overs, then that that's what we do, right? Um I mean the problem comes is when we have to go away from home and suddenly you're in you're in North America and you've got a squad of fourteen people then And we don't have the way. The way doesn't exist, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, yeah, I, I agree with the Stell here. I maybe I'm more again, maybe I'm being a Debbie Downer, but I don't think they've yet to establish their brand, right? Like, it, uh, unless that brand is, if you come to Sri Lanka, you're going to get slow, low pitches, and you're going to see death by spin, right? That could be that that that's yeah. their that's, that's their brand. Nice. We know what happens when you do that. <laughs> we though, know right? what happens, right? But we haven't. Yeah. That's what I've seen. Uh, I also think there's this interesting switch too, because Charith, in earlier this year was talking about 300 and 300 pitches and flat pitches. And now all of a sudden, right. We, and we, we should talk about this, that Rohit Sharma and Darren Sammy, who are two of the most savvy cricket minds going around, looked at what we did and more or less said, it doesn't matter that they did this. Um, and, and like, I guess, there's the internal validation that we get from winning, but also what is the rest of the cricketing community thinking about how we're approaching these things? It's, it, but th to I be honest, do, do you guys feel like the rest of the cricketing community actually even pays attention to Sri Lanka? I don't think <laughs> they do. No, I don't no, mean this. Like, no, they I don't, think they it, don't. They absolutely you know, don't. Like, uh, it's actually quite disrespectful, right? Like yeah. no one's talking about Sri Lanka as a test team. When Sri Lanka's done Irish really, I mean, barring those two Pakistan tests, they've been really good, right? Sorry, yeah. Nick. Can... And I, no, I also think when like a team like India come to uh, Sri Lanka, there's a certain amount of like presumption and entitlement that they're just mm. going to roll them over. And that when that doesn't happen, it's like an easy fallback to say like, oh, they gave yeah. us some rank turners, so this doesn't mean anything. Mm. Uh I mean, oh, we and it should have that, uh, it should have acted as a lesson to them, right? Like that their batters can't play spin, yeah. and yeah. they've and lost I that mean, series to New Zealand because of that. And we do say that, like, obviously the spinning pitches close the gap between like sides who can score four hundred and sides who can't. But it doesn't turn yeah. it into a total crapshoot, right? You still mm -hmm. need skill and nous to uh, yeah. be able to win on those. One, one thing we actually haven't talked about, I don't want to get too discursive, but is that like, I've also feel like there's been a real upsurge in the fielding since Sanath took over. Mm. And that, like that, those kind of aspects of things. Or do you think, do you guys think No, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Chan Chandana is, I guess like, yeah. Um, yeah. I, and I guess it depends on whether you think like some of these things are long-term shifts or mm. short-term shifts, right? Like we can't see what they're doing at the HPC or what they've been doing for the HPC mm. the last 18 months, right? So I think that's, it's always hard to attribute and maybe that's just wishy-washy and maybe fielding is about energy, right? And Sana's got the right energy levels, yeah. but it's always, it, it's, it's hard to see like detach results from the immediate circumstances, but also the past circumstances that have produced them. So I think we're in a case where in 12 months time, we'll know a lot more about Sanat's program totally. than we do now, right? Because we'll have had more evidence. We'll see how players change under him as opposed to how they were changing before him. And I think it also comes down to like, sometimes when you're winning everything goes your way right like even if there is the odd catch dropped or odd error in the field you don't really pay that much attention to it you're more focused mm. on the result yeah whereas when you're losing and you're not feeling well it kind of things kind of spiral from there right yeah, yeah. Right. that's right that's like, very true 
yeah, guys, Mr. we've been Fain's rattling on oh, for quite right. a long time. Should we answer this last question or talk about it, and then we we can all part our ways and then enjoy our Sri Lanka cricket free <laughs> weekend? Um, define the SL brand of cricket. We've just tried to do that. I understand that this isn't directly about Sanath, but I haven't truly understood what it means. Also, <laughs> had we won one more game in England, do you San, do you think Sanath would be critiqued for thinking short term? They absolutely should have, and the longer. The further away I get from it, I think they definitely should have won at Lords. And they mm. definitely could have won at Lords. And I think it's fair to critique them losing at Lords yeah. because it was because of this like the and decision. What about right. Old Trafford, Marky? Should have yeah, won they, they, they could have they could have won at Old Trafford, but I think I can kind of forgive that because it was the first test. Also it was it was absolutely freezing. It was miserable. Well. But was- aside from like a couple of really crap sessions, I thought that they to, were just better than England at Old Traf- Trafford. That's the game that I look back yeah. on and think that they really should have won. I think I think from an English perspective, actually, when Baz and, um, is removed from his position, probably just after the next Ashes and they lose 5-0 in England in Australia next year, <laughs> I think the, the rot start, was started by Sri Lanka, or at least the alarm bell <laughs> should have been ringing during that series because they should have just gone, hold on. Like I think that's what we... That's our role right now, right? Like... We played New Zealand, beat them 2-0, thumped them. And we showed India that, like, New Zealand is nothing. New Zealand goes yeah. there, beats them. We created yeah, the a, kind of rot with England. With a lie detector test of international <laughs> cricket. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's God. the brand. That's the brand, yeah. That's, that's the brand. The brand. I, I, I still think in that, in that final test against the Oval, the brand was they figured out how to do it. They dropped Pramath. They just... They actually, the other thing about that test is, is that I think it's kind of under talked about is they got angry. Like, we just, as a people, we don't, well, I suppose we do get angry with each other, but not with other people, right? <laughs> and I think we need to, um, like, you know, was it the day three when they started talking about bouncers and stuff like that? And then it just suddenly started breathing fire. And then it just set the whole English cricket ablaze and they haven't really recovered since. It's still on fire, tumbling around the West Indies. Um, like a like a racing driver getting out of their, their cars, it's run into the into the pit lane on on, on flames. Um so I think they kind of figured out the way, and the way was to get angry about it. And maybe some of get gets that emotion. Again, it's all like we kind of don't know, right? Because you like you don't know what what goes on with these teams, but that won't stop us speculating. Guys, should we leave it there because it's been ninety yeah. minutes. Thank you. So, for in joining conclusion, us. we don't know. In conclusion, <laughs> we don't know. We we need to wait and see, right? Yeah. But I think you know if if Sanath or anyone else at SLC or any of the players are listening, there's loads of things to think about. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't um, ban me from. Uh... <laughs> yeah. If you've got this far and haven't hit the subscribe button, I don't know what else we can do. Like, it's fine. You don't want to subscribe. 90 minutes in, that's cool. But keep watching, keep listening, leave us your comments, leave us your likes. Um, we love hearing from you. Uh, we're all part of a big community. Uh, the women have kind of the women's team have disappeared for the moment, but the men's team are back in action against New Zealand um, next week. So we'll be back with updates from that. Um, through that series and then of course we're looking forward to this uh, South Africa test series as well Um, lots going on with shrunken cricket at the moment Uh, we'll be with you every step of the way along it thanks for watching thanks for listening bye